Good evening, everyone. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are really honored and excited to be here with all of you tonight from around the country and around the world to celebrate not one, but two books by Terrence Hayes. Terrence is here in conversation tonight with Atlanta's own Jericho Brown for a celebration of So to Speak, as well as Watch Your Language, Visual and Literary Reflections on a Century of American Poetry, which is a fascinating collection of graphic reviews and illustrated prose addressing the last century of American poetry. He is the National Book Award-winning author of Lighthead, and tonight's event is co-hosted by the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American Culture and History. We know all of you are going to have lots of questions and exciting, you know, comments and stuff. Feel free to put it in the chat. It's going to be a multimedia event tonight. We're going to be watching um, some videos, having some discussion, uh, but do feel free to put your questions in there and we'll see what we can get to. I'm going to introduce Jericho Brown first. Uh, if you live here in Atlanta, um, but really if you are paying attention to poetry, uh, Jericho needs no introduction. But just in case you missed out, Jericho Brown is the author of The Tradition, for which he won the Pulitzer Prize. He is the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for the Advanced, for Advanced Study at Harvard, and the National Endowment for the Arts. He is the winner of the Whitting Award. His first book, Please, won the American Book Award. His second book, The New Testament, won the Ansfield Wolf Book Award. His third collection won the Patterson Poetry Prize and was a finalist for the National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award. His poems have appeared just about everywhere. Um, and he is currently the director of the creative writing program and a professor at Emory University. So welcome, Jericho. We are always honored to get to be in your presence, whether in person or virtual. Uh, so we're glad that you're here and we're especially glad that you're here to celebrate with Terrence Hayes, who is the author of American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin, which is the winner of the 2019 Hurston Wright Legacy Award and Lighthead winner of the 2010 National Book Award. His other poetry collections are So to Speak, How to Be Drawn, Wind in a Box, Hip Logic, and Muscular Music. He's also the author of To Float in the Space Between, A Life and Work in Conversation with the Life and Work of Etheridge Knight, which was winner of the 2019 Poetry Foundation Pegasus Award for Poetry Criticism. His honors include a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a 2014 MacArthur Fellowship, he lives in New York City, where he is a professor of creative writing at New York University. So we are in very esteemed company tonight, and I'm going to get out of the way so that we can get right into it. But once again, thank you both so much for being here. It's truly an honor and a privilege to get to host you. Thank you. Thank you, Yor. Um, Terrence wants, Terrence, hi. Uh, Terrence wants to start by showing us uh, the trailers for these books. I mean, I think it was two, right? So let's 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 get this started. I want to leave time for the um for the audience to have questions. I think ER ER is going to in trouble, so don't let it get too far. The Underworld Marvin Gaye Walking Tour. On my second visit to Ostend. The Belgian shore town Marvin Gaye lived in, in self-exile, a few years before his father killed him. I recalled my first visit and how there was no sign Gaye had ever been there. I could not find the inn he stopped in, after dragging nothing but baggage back from the underworld. There was no evidence he signed the guest book Orpheus in the Invisible Inn. I knew the route of transportable waters. I knew the river of flame blackened or enlightened the soul, drowning or floating. But I did not know how the river of sadness was different from the river of tears. The first time I set out on the trail of Marvin Gaye, I was a man with no shadow in the darkness. After midnight, a loud, terrible band of tone-deaf townsfolk played in the end I dreamed Gaye used to haunt. Though he could not recall the exact song sung back then, the ancient barkeep recalled Marvin Gaye singing a cappella a few chilly off-season evenings to melancholy women who were something more than wooed 
by the miraculous, now nearly forgotten sound of what may have been, for some, the only time in a lifetime a man like him sang like that to them. That wasn't it. That wasn't it. Did it stop? Some more. No, he probably thought that was over. But there, was, there was a little bit more at the end. I think it's all right. We can keep on. Do up the next one. Anya's here. So the next one will be for the prose book, I think, if it, if it's, uh, it, can, it can be queued up. Hello, stranger. It seems so good to see you back again. How long has it been? Seems like a mighty long time. Oh, mama, mama, so glad. That's it for that. So I don't know what that does for giving a sense of what I'm trying to do, but that's just me playing around with something like you know my ideas of trailers for the books. Um, I wanted to ask you, well, maybe I'll ask a different question. What is it that you don't get asked that you think you ought to get asked? Or would you just rather people not ask? <laughs> would you, cause I know you kind of, you don't like for people to ask questions. That's right. Yeah. I just rather, um, talk about that. Yeah. I don't feel like, um, you know, poetry means you really can't explain it. You know, it's, that's why we call it poetry because we can't explain it. If it's so much of it's about innuendo and subtext. So yeah, I always feel like uh, even in terms of the marketplace, I would be like, well, if you have bought the book, it's sort of your, if you want to be a capitalist then you, it's your property to decide what it is. And if you're not that, then it's your gift. I would not tell you how to deal with the gift. If you just think about the kinds of exchange that we might have. So I just, there's no real, even as a teacher, I'm not interested in explaining other people's poems. So I just find mm -hmm. all idea of it. It's like, uh, I, I said this because somebody asked me an explanation. I was like, but that's like asking a painter to explain, to make a painting about the painting. If you want me to write an introduction to the book, the book is the introduction. The book is the explanation, you know? So yeah, I, otherwise I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> but you did, but you did write an introduction to this book and you did, uh, and this book, the prose book, at least this book includes um, introductions that you've written for other books and you've been in the position that I'm in right now, which is, um, you know, I'm supposed to ask you questions. <laughs> what do you do <laughs> when you're in that position, but you know, but you yourself don't believe in it and you know the person doesn't believe in it? Well, I mean, I do. <laughs> I just think that <laughs> writers write. So the analogy with the painter is the same idea. Like, it's not like painters don't go out and talk about their paintings necessarily, but they're not introducing them necessarily. Like, you know, as I said, the painting about a painting. So yeah, I do, I write it out. Like I can write what I think the book is about, but if you're gonna ask me to talk about it, I'm like, well, you know, writers write, talkers talk. So I do feel like a lot of the stuff that I'm asked, if I can put it into language, I'll just make a better sense than if I'm like in these kinds of moments or in some, even a Q and A kind of space sometimes. So I, I do like answer questions that surprise me. How about that? to ask your original question. I just like, it's early in the process, so anything you ask is going to be surprising. But I just like something that makes me say something new. And, and as a general premise, like to be surprised too by something I will say is a pretty good bar for me in these kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. so I, um, I was looking at, um, well, I really do love this poem that's on 67 of the, the poetry book. It's called Another Great Ravager of the Crops Was the Boll Weevil. Something that happens in this poem that I think happens a lot in the book is the mention of the Carolinas, um, which happens throughout 
your work. You know, uh, I think it's if you read a bunch of Terrence Hayes books, you understand Terrence Hayes is from South Carolina. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. You also understand if you read a bunch of Terrence Hayes books, you understand Terrence Hayes has a really interesting relationship um, to his family um, or a relationship to his family that the family keeps coming up. Uh, for instance, in, in both, I can't, because I read them sort of in tandem, uh, you know, the fish always come up, right? The, 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 the summers in Florida always come up. Uh, in this book, though, in the poetry book, I think I saw more of your mother uh, more than I've ever seen before. And I saw more of the Carolinas named in a way than I had ever seen before. And I wanted to know whether or not you thought those two things had a relationship to one another. And I also wanted to know how... Uh, I think of a very long, you probably wouldn't even remember, but a very long time we had a, ago, we had this uh, conversation about, you know, seeing oneself as a Southern writer. And there's something about this this poetry book that is Southern. Even right. when it goes to Cleveland, it seems to be like Southern. Do you know what I mean? So can you talk about that a little bit? That's a um, good question. Is, book, are you, is that purposeful? Did that happen to you? Why is your mom coming up so much? Why are the Carolinas coming up so much? Uh, are you a Southern writer? I have a quick, immediate answer that I'm still unpacking, like the thing that I'm working out now because of a trip. And then I have like my long term answer, which is connected to you and Natasha. So the first part is that I just went to Pittsburgh, which, you know, people in Pittsburgh think I'm from Pittsburgh, you know, because that's where I kind of became a poet. And that's where I found support. My poetry mother, Toy, is there. I saw her this weekend. But I have never until this weekend come into some kind of close close to an era in Pittsburgh in terms of just like, you know, my Yona's moving away, you know? So I'm like, well, I'm going to have a different relationship to this place. Only this Saturday did I say, I think it might be home because I was just going to so many landscapes and having memories of those landscapes. And I think more than that, like one's relationship to, you know, triggers more than like the notion of family. So I don't think I've ever associated home to my family because, you know, family can be a little disruptive and I think that's in it. So I, you know, my father was in the military. Uh, we kind of moved around a little bit, you know, and so it was still around the South, but I think I had never really contemplated or I contemplated as much as a kid who had some relationship to the military for a lot of my career. And then Natasha was writing about being a Southerner. I think you were writing about being a Southerner. So I do know it's not going to be the same as y'all, but I'm aware of thinking about that as part of my identity because I have never really thought about it as part of my identity. It's like, it's like saying, do you write about being black? I'm like, yeah, you know, it gets folded into it. I think it's just self-evident. So I don't necessarily meditate on it. But right now, as we sit here, I'm manifesting this question about home and family. Like, I don't think home has to be associated with family. It might just be associated with the abundance of memories in a place when you go back to it. So just walk on any street and can remember something having happened on that street, which is what Pittsburgh is like for me. So you know, yeah. So I think this notion of home is still one where I'm unpacking all the time. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to show a video now connected to that because I do have more because, you know, any opportunity to embrace that question does, I take it as a good opportunity. So a friend of mine wanted me to write a poem about the churches along the corridor of the South, of South Carolina. And even with the 16 Project, I have a poem in there about um, 1670, it's a guzzle, you know, guzzle for Eddie Hendricks. That too, when I was given options about what to write about, I wanted to write about a region of South Carolina. So it is a very conscientious thing because I'm making discoveries too. So one of the videos is this video called Watch Night, which, you know, watch shows up across the poem. So I think that, that helps for what I'm talking about. But really, I'm most excited about it because of the South Carolina landscape that emerges in the video as much as what the poem is trying to do about saying that South Carolina is where this whole notion of like Kwanzaa and watch night and freedom really first emerged that, you know, uh, South, South Carolina is where we first became slaves, where the first slaves happened in the 1640, 1740 Act. And it's where, you know, so there's questions for me about South Carolina and this whole notion of America. Yeah, I'm interested in, in exploring that because it's particular to my home, the way, you know, certain things in Louisiana are going to be interesting to you. Certain things in Georgia are going to be interesting to Natasha or Alabama. So, you know, yeah, I definitely, I think it's an a, a ongoing question about what my relationship to the South is. Uh, how about that for one? There was a bunch of questions in there. That's the one about, am I a Southern writer? Like, yeah, but it's certainly an evolutionary question. And I'm excited about that. You know, I'd be a Yankee writer too. I don't know. I might be a New York writer too. I don't know. Uh, you want to see this video? 
Sure. Let's see watch tonight. If you got it queued up there. An extended public service announcement. Mark your calendars now, brothers and sisters, for end of the year watch night services in the area. Spend twilight to midnight in a house with a pulpit of pews and atmospheric fellowship. If you are lost as a child's muddy shoe beside an anxious river, if water gathers beneath your nails when you touch it, get free of the twisted root. Some night it may be Freedom's Eve again. You may find yourself in a room somewhere in the near past or distant future awaiting Lincoln's decree. Upon the proclamation, two contests of resistance may ensue, like two troubled storms making a violent path to the sea. You may dress like a worshiper in the bowels of a warship made of animal and forest parts. You may quench your thirst with the rain on your lashes. You may dress like the woman who scours the schoolhouse until it is clean enough for church. The room may have been built according to the architecture of farmers and teachers dressed as slaves. After several hours working for the nothings of enslavers, black people raised the scaffolding of holy shelters in the dark. Someone may have slaughtered and prepared the cow that provided the hide for the preacher's Bible. Someone may have smuggled raw cotton from the field and later worked it until it was useful cloth. The cross may be made of blacksmith scraps or a master carpenter's timber or two bound branches with a few almost imperceptible buds opening along the bark. You may be asked to wash the hands of an enemy. You may begin the night with your fist in knots of strong opposition and end it with your palms fanning your awe in woozy light. You may hear tales of the hour the state upgraded black folk from property to slightly more free. You may fall in love with a good listener, find food and drink in the cafeteria, a visitor such as yourself sequestered an entire year in America may find your name turns to music when spoken on watch night. If you feel like a tourist in a war-torn country, come figure it out with us. Area churches welcome you to service. Mother Emmanuel, New Horizons, Macedonia, Bridge of Life, Heaven's Door. Visitors welcome to churches featuring street names and whereabouts, the names of saints, apostles, angels, kings, and servants. Names featuring charity, restoration, faith. First African is not far from second African. The Chapel of Redemption is between the House of Conviction and the Temple of Forgiveness. There's a great organist at the Shepherd's Tabernacle. The 8th Avenue Church of Eve's Destiny is across the street from the 8th Avenue Church of Adam's Redemption. 100-year-old twins sing at the Olive Branch House of Holiness in Christ. The list of services is not exhaustive. Cancellation never happens. This is a public service announcement. Mark your calendars. Tomorrow loves you. Join us or contact us, and we will spread the word if your place of worship has watch night plans. Um, you know, that just really starts as an opportunity to get at some of the things you're asking about in the work. Like, it just grows out of wanting to think about the landscape. So I think, um, does that make me a Southerner or does that make me a person interested in the South? You know, it's a sort of perception. I know it's in the language. I know it can be a subject, but I'm sort of saying, yeah, I, I, I like the idea that I don't know what it is that we come from, that it kind of keeps opening up 
uh, that I can might be a, sometimes a pastor or poet. I might be sometimes even a, like a religious or spiritual poet based on my engagement with a landscape that has that as part of it. And then outside of that landscape, maybe not, you know? So yeah, I definitely value what comes up when I think about what, what the South is for me. Even if I think like the question of home is a slippery one. There's also in this book a return to, I mean, in a way I felt like I was reading the selected poems of Terrence Hayes, though I'm not reading poems from the past. You know, there's uh, Pecha Kuchas, there's uh, American Sonnets, uh, which, you know, we, we derive from, from Wanda Coleman. There's also, um, there's even a, an American Sonnet that is a golden shovel. Um, I just wanted to ask you about putting all of those things in a single book and whether or not you had any fear about that. For instance, you know, there is a thing that happens where you probably, I know I would feel, I mean, even with duplexes in my next book, I feel like, hmm, is this like a thing I can do? Or is this something that I would see somebody else do and think they were <laughs> like, get over it? <laughs> do you know yeah. what I mean? Well, I mean, we're trying to mine new terrain as artists. Yeah. So are you mining new terrain when you write another golden shovel? First I thing mean, is like, maybe just these questions change as you get older, because I just mostly think of these things as exercises now more than rituals. So I would say for a long time in making forms, like with the anagram forms and even the golden shovel, I was just like, I'm done. You know, let me just move on. That was a fun thing. But that isn't one sort of when you're young and you're trying to figure out what you can get away with, how many records you can break. But you know, by the time I'm getting to the American Sonnets, that's very much a response to an atmosphere and a response to a relationship. So it's the atmosphere of politics and my relationship with Wanda and saying, my girl and my knowledge, that's gonna help me get through this. So now what that means is there will still be days where I wake up and I still need Wanda and I still need that form to, to get loose. So in that regard, I feel like that understand that about myself, which is to say, you know, when I was writing those sonnets, I did think I was going to write them for four years. And so even though the book came out in 2018 and we had these two more years, there were a lot of days where I still needed to write American sonnets to get that out of my system so that I could write something else. So I think they'll probably come back because that's how Wanda wrote them. She never put together a selected. There is a collection of her American sonnets now on the same press that did her, uh, her, her new and her selected poems, but she never put them in a book because I think of that form for her, maybe as we think of sonnets, like there's always be an occasion where you might want to write a sonnet. And so that comes back. The same thing for the Pecha Kucha. I was, it, you know, I was just letting myself feel that impulse and seeing it through. Same thing with the DIY sonnets. Like a lot of this stuff, uh, DIY Sestinas, a lot of it now, I'm letting it sort of just be a response to why we have form. Like the day I think I need this form, and I'm going to write it as opposed to a kind of like, I tried that. I don't need to try it again. Does that make sense? So, you know, at this point, I'm like comfortable with that. Number two, I will say to you, I have said, you know, to my editor and to my friends, I will never do uh, a new and selected. I think people can do that when I'm dead. So I do feel like I don't know what the next book will be. But as a person who will never do a selected, I think that's OK for me. That doesn't bother me because I'm not. I, I don't think I'm going to put my poems together and try to. Anyway, we don't need to talk about why I won't do one, but I don't. If this is close to that, I don't think I'm OK with that. <laughs> when you were younger, you thought about breaking records? I'm talking about a young poet's relationship to form and a po young poet's relationship to the canon or so to write like the exercise of doing those anagram poems that was in my second book. And then feeling like that exercise, I learned what I needed to know from that exercise, which is to write a kind of more lyric, kind of enigmatic poem, and then apply that principle to the work to come after that. But not to ever do anagram poems, which I've never done again. And then saying if that American sign, was a thing like, it wasn't an exercise in the form, it was the form to help me work out some shit. And so the things that it prompted will still come back around. And so when they do, I think, yeah, I'll be able to use that form. Uh, certainly if Donald Trump gets elected again, I'm gonna come up with something. I don't know if American sign will help me if you have to deal with something like that again. But I say to you, that wasn't my young relationship to form as a kind of, the form is to help me get through something as opposed to I'm trying to master the form to become a better poet. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to think about that in terms of breaking records. Can you show your video with Bob Ross paints your portrait? Yeah, that's another long one. It's only a few of them are long. So this was a long one too. And that's sort of the idea. It felt like they dragging a little bit anyway. So y'all get ready. And what I'll say, I'm not gonna say anything. We can talk about it. We'll just watch it and you can 
ask me what you want to ask. All right, yeah, let's watch that one. That's fine. I made these things so I wouldn't have to read them, so. Bob Ross paints your portrait. Today, we're going to get to work on the details of your expression. And believe it or not, the only color we're going to use will be blacker than most blacks. We use a black canvas and just a single finger instead of a brush. So let's take and dab the tip of a pointer finger into the black like so. And now we're going to touch everything between jawbone and temple, cheek and nostril, lip and brow, on both sides of the mouth. You folks at home are welcome to use a thumb, use a pinky or pinky toe. I just want you to enjoy yourself. Get the feel of the color until it suits you. And just gently tap, tap gently the color into the shape of a forehead. There we go. Maybe like we're looking for a tiny button to open up on the crown of the head. Gently dabbing and tapping the black in. There we go. Okay. We want it all to be approximately the same deep space black. Black hole black moving between our canvas and fingertip. Gently, barely touching. Tapping and touching. Layers of fingerprint until we have the look of a deeply textured black. Like so. Okay, now we're going to put some of the past and the background around your mind, all the way out to the edges of the canvas where all kinds of things are happening. In the distance, maybe we'll place a mother and a father, but we'll make them mostly visible in your expression. What's so nice about these black canvases is if there's light shining directly on them, they look totally different. It's almost like having two paintings in one. The night sky, the landscape, the mother and father, we want it all to disappear and appear to disappear. Hmm, okay. Maybe there's a stretch of love that sort of graduates into nothing. We want to touch gently enough to calm the longing, the boundless beauty bound in you. It's like debating whether water is bluish green or greenish blue before it blackens. Don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. And we can begin applying some little black stars in the background without changing our technique very much. Okay? Wherever we picture stars, we can just touch the canvas like so. We can add black stars for eyes and black stars for scars. We want it all as black as the space around the constellation. There we go. And maybe we want to take and add a little bit more of the past. It's happening all the time. Just enough to convey what we're trying to feel, the texture beneath the black. Okay. But maybe one parent is a little bigger than the other. Maybe one gives you your stinger and the other gives you your shell. So we'll have to work a little harder and just lay in some of your favorite color, which is black, under the blackness. Lamp black and ink black. Boot black and blackjack and blacker. Just gently tap, tap, tapping. Now, I think I mentioned it earlier, but in case you missed it, if you have questions or comments or something we can help you with, please feel free to drop us a line. Lay in some blue black and ivory black, jet black and blacker, gently tapping and touching. There we go. I just love to hear from you. You have all kinds of beautiful depths and layers and shapes of black, okay? Now we're going to handle your hair like a lovely coat of black feathers. Or it might be a black feather hat, a black feather wig, afro, or aura. We'll take our finger and just make little crosses across your crown. Folks trying this at home might want to make big, bold plus signs if you feel bold and expansive, whatever you like. You might be the color of hair the night before it turns gray in the darkness. 
color of sadness or escape. I can't shake the memory of my one mad love with the tip of her finger pointing gently up inside her. Gently make the shape of blackness black. There we go. If we pick up a little bit of the darkness under the color, that's okay. That's just fine. We want to pull the darkness out from the edge and blend it over the curve of your nose, following the curve of your speech down into the onyx, the gunmetal, the black magic rabbit hole of a top hat over the mind, kind of black, moving between canvas and finger, like yep. so. Take your time. Soon the darkness stands back for you a little, a little black ornament, a few black beads, and everything in the background where your body begins and ends. Can you feel yourself emerge as you fall backwards? Wait till you hear what I've got planned for next week. Is who hurt you equal to who you hurt? Is who loves you equal to who you love? We'll start right there and work in the direction of desire. But right now, let's begin working on your shadows. Stop it there. I told you it was long. So there's a, um, um, you know, there's a lot of black in that poem. Yeah. And then, uh, so I sort of wanted to turn to everything that's happening here, sure. uh, which, which I think you mean to be very black. <laughs> and as I'm, as I'm reading this, um, it's also, um, what is the word for it? It's, uh, it's quite varied in the way that it goes about uh, being a book of nonfiction. For instance, we have a page that's like this, which uh, begins to show us things about um, processing, but also about influence. Uh, it's a book that's very big on tracking influence. And then um, there's, it also has uh, these questions, which I find really, uh, so there's timelines. All of these, by the way, including the covers are Terrence's drawings and paintings. Um, there's also a quiz that you have to take if you read the book with these questions. One of these questions is, is the poetic canon essentially a poet's hall of fame where members are voted by peers and scholars? And then there are many other questions. Some of the questions seem like I can answer them. Some of them are pretty wild. Um, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this question. I feel, uh, is, it, um, is it better to be judged by your peers or by the general public? Do you think of the world, do you think most of the world rot rotates between the poles of what's going on and let's get it on by Marvin Gaye, which I really, you know, I really love uh, these questions. But this question about canon, you know, as I was reading this book, I was like, oh, this is sort of like a way of establishing canon in a way, because there are all these um, short prose poems, which are almost, uh, which I really love because they are, uh, I love seeing Lorenzo Thomas's name. I'm, I love that Lorenzo Thomas got a poem. I am particularly enchanted by the fact that Barbara Chase Rabaud, who I often forget <laughs> about, has a, um, has a prose poem. Good artist. Uh, yeah. Visual artist. Well, that's it. I mean, it's interesting to me. Of course, you as a visual artist would be the person to bring that particular poet back to mind to me as a poet. Um, but I wanted to ask you, something does happen in this book it was black, 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 black. And then suddenly there's Tony Hoagland. And yeah, yeah. I actually made a list of white people because uh, uh, that always feels good. I feel like white people have made lists of black people. So yeah. Tony Hoagland, then Linda Hall appears, then Lucy Brock Broido appears, then David Berman, Frank Stafford. And we right. end, or at least we don't end the book with or close to the end, there's Bridget Begin Kelly. Um, and I'm sort of interested also, so I want to know about that choice and what's happening. It's like, Terrence don't like no white writers till we get to the 19th, till they're born in the 1950s. Poor Adrian Rich. Do you know what I'm saying? Now there uh, is mention, there is the mention of white writers throughout the book. You know, Plath comes up, Stephen comes up a great deal. You have poems that you had out in the past for Stevens uh, or through Stevens, maybe I should say, uh, in, in the book. But so maybe you could, can you talk about what white people are doing in this book? And particularly, um, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that. I, I, I sort of wanted to ask, like, it's sort of, uh, I thought it was interesting that, you know, I'm reading this book and everything's Black, and then there's Tony Hoagland, who we know to be, if and not divisive, at least in some people's minds, a divisive figure among poets and among Black poets. You know, in that, 
piece. I mean, we could talk about that if you want to talk about that. I mean, I guess I could read that. I don't even know how to read that. You don't have to read it. You could just talk about it. I mean, you don't want to read. That's fine. Once upon a time, a, black, a white man took a black family into the woods, you know, like, so, and, and even, the, anyway, so what I would say to you, I, I think I got, again, two answers on this one, which would be like, well, you know, I knew three of those four people and Linda Hall, who I did not know, was just like seminal to me, who came to me through like, you know, Yusuf Komenyaka, and I just barely matched meeting her. So it doesn't become like a broad, objective, critical, critical inquiry. Like I ain't know those other people. I, I had the Wallace Stevens thing. I still have questions around that. And I'm going to say a second thing that's connected to like what maybe will come next. But as it is, late in the process, I was already kind of onto the cars and thinking about toy and thinking about black poets because, you know, that's what I think about. But as I was like, you know, I could do this with, I still have these other people that I have these stories and impressions of. So like, you know, uh, Lucy Brock Broido's cat. I put that category, Lucy Brock Broido, David Berman in the category of like Renegade, DJ Renegade, and even Tim Siebel's and perhaps Patricia Smith too, in terms of, not even in terms of race, but yeah, trying to think about as we get closer to the moment, how those things for me anyway, start overlapping. So here's the thing. I was just, uh, I just had this thing, you know how this goes last week where I just found myself every day writing a different tenure letter to a different poet. And I was like, man, I wish I could like process this. I wish I could use this information some way. So my goal right now, it was too early for you, so I couldn't do it. My goal right now is like, to do those prose poems for my peers and the people younger, the people that I've written like a million recommendation letters for or tenure letters for or fellowship recommendations. So there's so many people over these 20 years that no one's ever seen. So it's like the stuff I know about your work, I've never like reviewed it in public, but I've written about it many times. So what I think I would want to do to answer your question about how it gets more diverse is I would imagine like if I was going to do a third book, I could just fill it with prose poems about all the poets of my generation, you know, Elizabeth Alexander, people who aren't in the book, you know? So it's sort of like what really happens later in the book is I'm really thinking about those people are the people that died. Like David Berman was a friend. Lucy Bright Brodo was a friend. Tony, a complicated friend. So his is probably the most, actually the one about David Berman is still like a story only I would know. So I'm really relaying these stories as much as, you know, I might be trying to think about their poems in a way that I think about other people's poems. So again, that opening up, I would think I would keep moving towards it, but it's just like, I didn't know those other people. I didn't know Linda Hall, but I've lived with her so long. I didn't do Larry Levis. I didn't do Frank O'Hara. So I still feel like I'm interested in still thinking in language about these other writers, just as they are important to me more than anything else, even more than era, I guess. So then, um... The book also has these moments of what you call DIY Sestinas. Uh, and I just wanted to know, um, I'm trying to, let me see if I can pull up what this looks like. Uh, I got to find a page number 80 something. Oh no, I'm in the wrong book. So, and you sort of talk, the books, the other thing that I should say for the sake of the audience is there is a way that you have to read the books together, you know, buy one and be happy, but you probably need the other one to really get into. I mean, there's a way that, one book, I mean, even the poetry book begins providing context for the other book. Um, you have, a, this is actually, interestingly enough, the note section of a book where you are giving uh, the readers of the book exercises, uh, telling them to write their own sestinas. Um, that happened earlier. You give us one of those sestinas showing us how you went about writing this do-it-yourself sestina. Um, let's see if I can find it. I'm sorry, I'm not. Uh, you know, I think there's something about that impulse. I love this, you know, the instructions to write a, a Sestina based on these drawings of Octav Octavia Butler. But then, you know, in this book, too, this book sort of towards its end, uh, when it's time to have a review, for instance, of Tim Siebel's his book, Voodoo Libretto, uh, his new and selected, uh, the review is a board game. Um, book bio board game, which sort of looks like this. And you tell us how to play while also talking about the book. Um, when you're talking about DJ Renegade's book, um, you go about that by telling us about a fortune telling machine. There's that machine with a picture of Renegade in it. Uh, and I was just wondering about that and that, that impulse, uh, not just to write about things or not just to write things, but also to engage an audience as if 
they would do the same thing or as if they would, or as if, as if they can read uh, the Tim Siebel's book, Thinking About the Board Game or something. I don't know. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know this stuff is early. So all my answers are big and messy and I'll be able to choose like the best ones at some point. But right now I'll say initially, you know, it, I, my double record idea that I worked for like four years with was, was that both books would have the same title. They were both called So to Speak and maybe the book now called Watch Your Language, it might be S-O-W or S-E-W. It was like, I don't think it's Sal. So I was working that out, but I sent them in, in their first, you know, uh, form as two titles. So the marketing people, not my editor necessarily, not, they were like, we can't really sell that. And so I was like, well, uh, the money's all going to the same place. And I'm really trying to talk about this conversation that's happening. So once they said, no, I actually waited for a minute. And it was like, well, I, I'm not going to put two books out if they're not going to have the same title because that nobody's going to know what I'm doing. So to try to account for that after I worked out about three months whether I was going to do it or not, I was like, I'll do sections. So in the poetry book, the first section is watch your mouth. And the second section is watch your step, the cough or virus. And the third section is watch your head. So that's where like the self-portrait, you know, is in. And then this book as a kind of fourth section to the first three sections, almost like an appendix, is watch your language. So I am though, even the gesture of watching and what that means for reading and what that means for action and all those things, I am suggesting as a teacher would that, you know, you can do all of the stuff that I'm doing. I am not really from the position of critic so much as the coach in some ways, saying even with the DIYs and, you know, I think that's always been in my work. Like I'm as interested in getting people to make stuff as I am and hearing what they think about what I made, you know, probably more. And so I do think my, my primary position, and this is something that I have to articulate better going forward, is not really even as the critic, but in that prose book as a teacher. You know, I am not trying to lay down laws. I'm not trying to even explicate or explain things. So much as kind of ask questions and encourage interactions. And so that I hope is a through line. I don't know if anybody will get it. Even you didn't say it. So I wondered, even with the different covers, I had all these ideas for what would have been a double record. And I would say, I let him, I was like, okay, whatever. We'll see if this works. But clearly it's a lingering idea of how to communicate the conversations. You know, David Berman's in both sections. There's things that are happening to convey a kind of conversation, but we'll see if people can see the ways that I think the two are, you know, that it's four sections on this idea of watching, watching, mm -hmm. really watching others and watching yourself. I think that's what I'm trying to articulate, but we'll see if that's, if that's what's communicated. I think we're at a point now where we could take questions um, from, from the audience. I'm not sure if there's a if I just need to scroll the chat, maybe that's what I'm what I should be doing. Um, which I just and so if I go back up, I'm not sure if we'll have questions here per se. I did see one about southernness, but I don't know how much it makes sense after the question has come after you know your answer came through. I'm trying to see. I'm almost that it. I so showed the, uh, the, you know, what's the short one? I think these videos are dragging a little bit. I just saw no questions there, so I'm gonna just move right past that. Um the um George Floyd. Let's show that one. That's shorter, and it, it, I hope it'll move a little faster. And then if there's questions after that, we can see. How about that? Dr. can you show George Floyd, please? Thank you. Thank you. 
too quick are we out of time at the end of it is gonna i'm gonna read the poem just did you want to see um er i think maybe there was more that's, that's my bad i'm gonna fix it my bad okay. it's coming off too quick we can move, we can move. no I, I i'm sure we can get we can get it back it just took one sec it is dragging a little bit that's why i'm like it's okay okay i'm gonna get to it tech man i know it technology it cut. That's where it cut off, right there. Okay, but well, it's fine. I think well, that. Yeah, that was the end. Of, I don't know what happened, but that was the end. That's why. There should be like another ten seconds or something. That's fine. Um. Yeah. So then it comes. You can kind of see the poem running at the bottom at the end of it. I just read the poem. Uh. You know, as the images come together at the end of it, and I'll just say about all of this. Yeah, I was just through. Um. Especially when we were mostly online, trying to figure out ways to visualize these things. I, I think now that we're kind of moving back to the normal world, it's not so important that people have the visual stuff. It was really for this format, and even with that one, the, you know, the drawings that I made to accompany the poem in the video didn't make it into the book. So I don't think there. I think I saw a question. I didn't even say that somebody asked a question about the relationship between these two things. Um, so I think this, you know, this would be the occasion to show these things, but it's not. The book doesn't rely on the music and the videos to uh, enlarge the project, but they're out there online. But you can see all of Terrence's videos um, for all his poems going back 5,000 years on Vimeo. It's a secret, secret hobby. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it's such a secret. I mean, you know, for my friends, I don't know about it, but. It's like painting and playing a piano. It'd be like 30 people on it. I ain't know, I'm not playing piano on it. I didn't put that on. But you know, it's like 30 views in 50 years. So I feel like ain't that many people know about it. <laughs> What's the question? I think somebody wants you to say your favorite. I don't really understand this poem. Tony Hoagland and Yusef Komiyaka poetry mixtape. Do you have a top four? You sort of talk about this in the um in the essay with Renegade about y'all arguing about which Yusef Komiyaka poems are your favorite Yusef Komiyaka poems. So maybe, maybe you could tell us what Renegade's faves are and what your faves are. I mean, since you already know the information, I can read it to him if you don't remember. But you know what I'm going to say about that, though, is like, I think I'm just more, this would still go back to like, who shows up in the book, why? It's so personal. I mean, this is what I'm saying. Like, it ain't no memoir, but it's not criticism. It would just be as personal as the kind of teacher who goes on tangent when they be talking about, oh, I remember this time I met Gwendolyn Brooks in the grocery store, as we're talking about whatever that, po that poem is. So I do think like, I'm interested in synthesizing like that kind of personal relationship and something like a historical or cultural relationship to a lot of the material. So a question like that, Tony Hogan or your top five, I'm always just putting them together. Like what I thought when I saw that was like, ooh, uh, Tony Hoagland plus, you know, Yusuf Komenyaka because of the mixtape thing. It just makes me think about something like that. And that comes up in those in those essays around Renegade, where I'm like, oh, you know, the child of Lucille Clifton and Wallace Stevens, that's interesting. Someone who could embrace both those aesthetics in one aesthetic or synthesize those aesthetics. You know, that's what I'm interested in. So I, you know, I just think of everybody kind of blurring into each other more than you don't want to be on no one person's bus. But I, I, I find like that you could hold both of those as interesting, that I could be a person who could be interested in, you know, opposites or things that I shouldn't be interested in is as interesting as making lists to me. So I'm just trying to always like, you know, not necessarily build a list, but build a library of sorts where people are in conversation. Um, you have a question in this other place that I didn't know existed. If I may be selfish, can you, this is from P. Will, if I may be selfish, can you speak to the influence of Bridget McGee and Kelly's work on your poems and maybe the poetry landscape? I love the piece you wrote about her. 
And again, she's a bridge too. So David was a friend. I, you know, I met I met Bridget too. And some of it is always the same. It's the same Wanda Coleman impulse of just like having encountered these poets in our long times of writing poems and just wanting to make sure everybody knows who they are. You know, I feel like that about Reginald Shepard. You did just an amazing job. You know, Ocean State, he gonna blurb it. Like an amazing job on this. I think I might blurb it too. How about that? You know, on this selected Reginald Shepard. Same impulse. Like, is it important? Like, do I have to understand everything about Reginald Shepard? Do I have to be a Reginald Shepard expert? Or do I have to be someone who maintains a relationship even now with Reginald Shepard's prose and with his poetry and just want other people to know that he lives? So is that piece that I write about him really like an explication or is it just like fanboying? You know, so same thing on Bridget. It's a person who I have always absorbed as an important writer. It's why she would be one of the ones that sent it. She's someone that I met, even though she didn't come out that much. So I care about her. She's someone who I was always like, what I knew about her with the book every 10 years, I know they got to be a manuscript somewhere, but where would I have opportunity to say that? How would I send people on the mission to see if there is, in fact, other Bridget McKean poems? I know what I can do. I can start my book of poetry with a line from one of the poems from that book, Iskandaria, that never got in, put anywhere. So if my book leads you to find that amazing, amazing poem that begins my book and is written about in the prose book, only people that are looking a certain way will, will be those kinds of detectives. So it ain't going to be everybody. But, you know, that's all I need is one or two people to be interested in some of those kinds of questions. So I would just say it's just me trying to, as with Etheridge Knight, as with Wanda Coleman, as with really anybody that we love, you know, Linda Hall. I'm just trying to, like, maintain and extend a conversation with these people. And so that's certainly true with David, who, you know, um, passed away right before the pandemic and, you know, I, so I still think a lot about him. And of course, I was going to write about him. And so he's going to show up in both books because he comes back to me. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's the best way I can answer it. I, I'm just making sure that Bridget stays on record. And you can see her in my work. As I said, when I say, like, I started the book of poems with a quote from her, um, a thing like me, I'm hoping that she does frame a lot of the narrative and a lot of kind of fable and allegorical stuff that's happening in it. And then I'm bringing, you know, whatever I would be to that kind of question, but her capacity for this sort of lyric, narrative, weird, spooky, visionary poems. Yeah, I want to do that. And I miss it. I miss a world that doesn't have her in it doing it. So I'm just trying to let her influence speak to me whenever I, you know, I feel that kind of, that calling. Did you, do you feel more free? You feel, it seems to me that if somebody's dead, you feel called to write about them as opposed to, do you feel more freedom? Uh, this is actually a question from Lauren Deland, right. sort of, mixing her question up so maybe i should ask it as it is right. uh, she, she says does writing about dead subjects like david dead people i imagine like david berman afford a kind of freedom that you don't have when writing about the living well no i wish that was true because you know i also got a piece in there about toy i got a piece in there about patricia smith no 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 you got pieces about all kinds of living people and, yeah, and yeah i would say i'm gonna tell you a little you know anecdote to that story about how i deal with this stuff but i wouldn't say that i mean i feel like i'm Sometimes it's like letters. You hope that the people in the world, I was eager for Toy to see it. I would be eager for Yusuf. Yusuf knows these things are in the world. There is another thing, though. You know, it's the uh, more personal things, the Florida stuff that frames the book. So, you know, the back of the book with the, the family and the fish stuff. I sent that to them because my family really doesn't, you know, know about the work, even though, like, the book's dedicated to my parents. But when I went home and was unpacking my bags and that book fell out and my parents went for it, I pulled it away from them. And I was like, oh. I send it to you, which, you know, I, I, I will, maybe I won't, you know, so I don't really talk about the work and it don't really come up. It's just that the book fell out. So they, I, they didn't really even know the books were coming out this summer. And I sort of, but my cousin Bebe in the Florida pieces, because it was in the New York, you know, it was in the Washington Post and it's a, it, it looks all like them, like those pictures about them. But it's really talking about me not really being in that family, being a bastard and going down there and the magic of that family, how that relates to me as a poet and why that fits with like Bridget Bikin Kelly, I would hope people would figure out. But I sent them a book and, you know, yesterday I said, oh, you know, when people on the professional people ask me about the work, I don't talk about it. Nobody in the family, my kids, uh, even my my part, ex-partner who's a poet, I don't talk about nobody with the work, but I hope you dig it. And then he just gave me a heart and I was like, I guess that's enough. I don't know what he thinks about it. I don't think I want to know. I, and when I wrote in the book, when I sent it to him, I was like, my mother says, everything I write is my imagination. And I think that lets me off the hook for her. So I'm going to say that to you. You know, this is just stuff in my imagination. 
I don't know what it's going to mean to you. I don't have to do that with poems. You know, Florida has shown up in my poems a lot. This family has shown up in my poems a lot. But in this book, even though the, the piece is about an African rainbow lizard, there's where I feel that. Not with the dead, it's with the living. So yeah, I, I'm writing about live people too. And I certainly feel, uh, I can only say to the people on the planet, you know, well, it's just my imagination. It's in my head. I'm trying to do something with it. And I'm eager to do that with like, you know, like, I don't know what that, if I was trying to do an allegorical prose biographical sketch of my love for you and my friendship with you and what I know about you in like a paragraph, I would love to do that. I would love to think about you that way, Jericho, and then see, you know, so I'm saying like, I have a lot of people in my life who I think about wanting to process or, or write that letter to. So it ain't really to the ghost. It's definitely, I mean, the, to the ghost, it is, it is, those are elegies, but um, the, the Patricia Smith and the Sonia Sanchez and the toy and the Cornelius and the Yusuf, I'm glad, you know, the, the DJ Renegade, the Tim Siebels, I'm beginning a thing that just keeps continuing for me, which is just talking to the, the family of poets that I have. And, you know, certainly you're one of those people. So I kind of think like that's just in the future for me to be able to do this for people on the planet. We, we have um, four more minutes and it might not be enough time for me to get to all these questions. I just had another question, um, which I think people... Uh, which I think would be of use. I, I thought about this considering what you were saying about Bridget Begin Kelly. Other uh, Bridget Begin Kelly's in the book, but other figures in the book include people like um, Elizabeth Bishop, who comes up here and there. Um, how many poems do you write in a day? Um, well, you know, I don't really at this point. This is what I'm saying about like what it means to be like 51 and haven't done a thing. You know, anybody that's had a job for 20 years, you have evolve in your relationship with it. So one of the things I think I'm gonna be talking about is like, I've had so many regular practices that have served me well in my life, including a regular writing practice. But then, you know, my son moved in and I was like, I'm gonna just see if that's gonna be, you know, my poem, which he, I think he found problems with. But it was me saying, now I'm gonna try to prioritize. I don't know like whatever, having not prioritized that is done for my, when I say this thing about my family and about like, so I say the exercise for me is just to adjust certain things. So right now I'm like, I just think I don't want to be expressive. So sometimes it's just like playing the piano and not recording it or just taking notes and seeing what that is and sketching and working on this idea of just trying to write about the people I care about that are alive and then not sending it out, just saying, oh, just messing around with stuff. So I do know like my personality means I'm always writing. I write every day. I just don't put no adjectives on it. I don't necessarily think about finishing it. And that is my exercise right now, just to be in a place where I'm like, maybe the next thing will just be prose poems. Maybe I don't even want to think about, is the line break the only thing that separates us from po from other people? So there's just questions about, I still have, and I'm excited about those not knowing, but you know, the thing that I say, the thing that I say to my students and say often in interviews is like, I just like to say, I want to be interested in the next poem and the last poem. The rest of the stuff is like marketplace, business, capitalism, making products. But as a person who wakes up every day, last poem, next poem. If the last poem was last year, if the last poem was last, last night, and if I have some momentum for the next challenge, that's all I need on a day-to-day -day basis. And I have that. I just don't put adjectives on it. I just say, last poem, next poem. I told you what I was working on. I'm working on some scraps about home. I'm working on some scraps about, you know, uh, people I'm going to be seeing soon. And like, that's enough for me at this juncture having worked a certain way. It's the same answer I gave about form. So I think that would be the most important thing that I'm learning about aging out as a poet, just trying to figure out how to stay, you know, ahead of myself and not taking too much for granted. Um, trying to take for granted for the freedom that I have gotten by working a certain way, but not um, thinking that I figured anything out really. I mean, you know, both these books are just a bunch of questions. One time, it's a thousand years ago, you told me I need to write more. And I was like, you ain't telling Bridget Bikini Kelly to write. Well, you ain't telling Elizabeth Bishop with her three book have, four book have and ass to write more. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> anyway. Um, writing and publishing are separate. Writing and even showing people are separate. But like, as I said early on, as a place just to give some shape to some crazy, crazy thoughts that you have is like where I am now. You know, that's why I just feel like creative writing. When I applied to MFA, I said, I want to be, I want an MFA in creative writing. I didn't know no better. It was what I wrote out. It was so long ago, I could write it in there. They put me in poetry. But I say to you, that earliest impulse of saying, we just want to be creative in our writing. Maybe we want to draw a little bit. Maybe we want to make some graphs. 
Maybe you want to have some white space. Maybe you want to do some erasures as Nicole is doing. Like I say to you, creative writing is sort of what I think is a better and more generous and more democratic way of thinking about how we do it. And that's separate from where your book goes in the bookstore. We know those questions of people who move in our product. We want them to sell our books. But for us in the day-to-day practice, I'm just going to say to you, I'm just trying to be making something and being creative at this point. Thank you so much, Terrence, for being here in Atlanta, as close as we could get you to Atlanta, the city I love and live in. Uh, I also just wanted to say thank you for including um, this piece that we included. It was really funny. Um, we included in, in my in my anthology, um, How We Do It, which is a craft anthology for Black writers. Um, po- the Poetry Foundation Journal Days from 2006, which were of huge and wonderful use to me when I was in graduate school. And so I really appreciate that. And I was so happy to see it again. I felt like, oh, no wonder he was quick to say yes to that. He was already on it. I had, I had forgotten about it. I, I really thought I was gonna fight with you about it. Then when I saw it in this book, I was like, oh, I didn't have, that's why I didn't have to fight, you know? So I was really glad to right. see that. And then, um, and I also, I also just wanted to say thank you and for the audience here. Yes, we do have a, a, a Reginald Shepherd selected coming out in April thank you. Thank of, you for that. of it's 2024, which I'm editing, which I'm happy to do. Thank you for that assignment, Terrence. Yeah. ER, that's all we got. That's all I got. I hear all the. Yeah, so no, Reginald Shepherd falling through the cracks. How can yeah. that be? We all know who Reginald Shepherd is, and we know that there's not enough in the world about him. So, you know, if I could do that little bit of thing, that's that's what a teacher would do. You know what I'm saying? So I'm glad you did that, and I hope uh, people find it when it's in the world. We'll be We'll be celebrating it. When it comes out, yeah, um, we'll come back and do something for it. We would love that for real. Um, so tonight, we want y'all to get both of Terrence's books. Uh, you're gonna click this teal button at the bottom center of the screen to get your copies. We will get them sent out to you directly right away. I did drop the link to How We Do It, uh, which is the brand new anthology that just came out what three weeks ago. It's great. It's also on audio. Or- yeah yeah oh, that's great <laughs> okay so yeah fourth of july um and we got um all both both authors backlist so if you heard about a book tonight that you were like oh i didn't know i didn't know they wrote that one in 2013 or whatever go back get you that one too um these are these are some deep benches here um so thank you both so much for being with us um we inches what's that you said deep benches? Benches. That's a sports. Maybe you're not a sports person. I mean, I am, but I, I I, was sort of hoping you said deep bitches. I can. We can mix it, it up. It's more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like I know you like that to be able to call Definitely you. Definitely the case with Terrence. Okay. Keep up. Yeah. I hope so. You know. If anybody ever sees me, uh, let me stop. I'll yeah. see y'all later. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Take good care. All right. I'll see y'all. Thank you. Thanks for it. Thanks for the opportunity.